webinars does not constitute endorsement or medical advice. Appropriate medical advice should always be sought from your own healthcare professionals. Eve Mayer is a speaker, writer, and entrepreneur recognized by Forbes as one of the most influential women in social media and is one of the eight women to follow on Twitter by CNN. After decades of struggling with obesity and reaching 300 pounds, she discovered fasting and changed her life. Eve speaks and consults worldwide on social media, digital marketing, company core values, and women's empowerment. She is a host of the Life in the Fasting Lane podcast. Welcome, Eve. Thanks so much. And Megan Ramos is a clinical researcher and has worked with Dr. Jason Fung since 2003. She co-founded the Intensive Dietary Management Program with him after being diagnosed with diabetes. Megan has educated and counseled patients in Europe, Asia, Australia, South Africa, and all over the United States and Canada. She has spoken at multiple conferences, including KetoCon, KetoFest, and CanFit Pro World Fitness Expo. Welcome, Megan. And I'm going to hop off and turn it over Hello, to Eve. Hello, everybody. Okay. My name is Eve Mayer, and I am from FastingLane.com, and I am joined by the beautiful Megan Ramos, who you can check out at TheFastingMethod.com. We're here today to talk about our book, Life in the Fasting Lane. This is me being Vanna White, although I have much less makeup on. So uh, this is our book. It came out on April 7th and it's Life in the Fasting Lane, How to Make Intermittent Fasting a Lifestyle and Reap the Benefits of Weight Loss and Better Health by Dr. Jason Fung, Eve Mayer, and Megan Ramos. So I'm going to ask Megan to kick us off by telling um, you guys a bit about who she is, who Jason is, and about the fasting method. Thanks, Eve. Um, so as, as was, uh, I guess, explained at the start of this, I started working with Jason when I was a kid. I was 15 and I had a keen interest in preventative medicine. Uh, Dr. Fung is a nephrologist. He's a kidney specialist. And due to my family medical history, I was particularly interested in kidney disease. And I had an, a great opportunity to do some research at his, uh, at his clinic. He was a brand new nephrologist. And I was a young student who was assigned to him at the time. Um, Jason's always thought outside of the box. Um, I've <laughs> now worked with him for 21 years. And he's always wondered what is outside of the box. He's, uh, he, he's mindful of what's in the box. But he wants to know what, what more is there to things. And he's always had this really keen interest in preventative medicine. I also had a very keen interest in preventative medicine. And um, starting to work with dialysis patients so young, I became absolutely petrified of type 2 diabetes. So in my mid-20s, I thought, okay, Megan, you need to get it together and start eating right. You already have diseases of obesity, even though you're not overweight yet, at least not according to the BMI. I had fatty liver and PCOS. Uh, so I started following the Canadian food guide, started working out with a trainer, blew all kinds of money on a fancy dietitian, and the end result was a whole bunch of weight gain and being diagnosed with my biggest fear, which was type 2 diabetes. So luckily, I was working with the right guy at the right time, and he was trying to figure out, you know, what is the root cause of type 2 diabetes? Because blood sugar levels don't necessarily make sense. And why can't people lose weight when he knows that his patients are eating less and moving more. There was something about it that just wasn't right. So he had started doing some research and I started fasting and I had great results. Within six months, I was no longer a diabetic. I had lost over 60 pounds and I had reversed all my metabolic conditions like PCOS and fatty liver. So we started, um, we started working with some of Jason's patients for fasting. Then we got requests uh, from all over the country uh, and then started to get requests from all over the world. So we developed an online program. We no longer have our office clinic. Um, we now have our program online where we have education, uh, community support. We have lots of live interact interactive 
features of our community. So people can really connect and talk with fasting and nutritional experts. Uh, and people can also work with a fasting coach if they need some more personal advice. So Jason and I <laughs> had a real wild last few years. I was actually writing the history of our program down this morning and I'm like, wow, this is just crazy um, how far we, we've come. Megan, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Megan's honestly pretty modest. She, she's not like me who I'll, I'll just openly brag about everything I do. But Megan has been treating people for decades. And I think of anyone I've ever asked fasting, fasting questions to, like how does it affect a person with this illness? Or how much you know, can a person expect to achieve with this? Megan always knows the answer. So <laughs> she's, she's really incredible. So. Um, my name is Eve, and um, you can find me on Twitter at Eve Mayor Media. That's where I do most of my communicating. I'm on I'm on Instagram as well, but I'm older, so I'm not as good on Instagram. But that's you know also at Eve Mayor Media and Fasting Lane. Um, I struggled with uh, 24 years of obesity. I peaked at 300 pounds. I tried diets and hypnosis and therapy and fitness instructors. Um, I also had three bariatric surgeries and although I often lost weight, I gained it back usually not all of it, but a lot of it. Um, and I had a really great life career wise and family wise and was very successful. And I just could not understand why I could be so successful in life, but so unsuccessful in my health and my weight. So I had um, pre-diabetes, PCOS, fertility issues, allergy issues, recurring bronchitis, uh, upper respiratory infections, pneumonia, um, sick every other month, pulled muscles, all kind of fun stuff. But I really just believed that I had a poor immune system. So um, I never gave up on trying to lose weight, but I really felt like it was hopeless. You know, I didn't, I didn't think I'd actually succeed. I just kept trying because, you know, I, I'm not going to give up. Um, in 2018, I started doing low carb. And for the first time in my life, I felt less hungry. And by less hungry, I meant, I mean, I went from feeling hungry every moment of the day, except for perhaps 20 minutes after a very large binge or a large meal. Um, hungry every moment of the day to one day only feeling hungry four or five times in a day. And um, when I asked my husband, who was a, a very fit guy, uh, if this is normal, he, and he said, yes, to only feel hungry four or five times a day, I really couldn't believe it. So I became really curious about why, you know, why do I feel hungry all the time? Is it just a mental thing? Is it a physical thing? Is it a combination? What's wrong with me? Um, and so I started to suspect that maybe it had something to do with insulin resistance. And doctors had told me I had insulin resistance and told me to take metformin, but I didn't know what insulin resistance was. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't, I didn't know what I should do. So I'd seen all these doctors who had told me to eat often um, and to keep my metabolism rolling. And I uh, did those things and I got fatter and I got less healthy. And so when I talked to a doctor friend of mine who suggested I read Dr. Jason Fung's book, The Obesity Code, I did. And first the book talked about how you should eat less carbs. And I'm like, great, I'm on the right track. I'm doing everything good. And then it talked about fasting, which in my world, being from South Louisiana and living in Dallas, Texas, I had only heard of fasting with friends who were Muslim, are Buddhist and use fasting as a part of their religion. I hadn't heard of it as a way to improve health. I hadn't heard of it as a way to lose weight. I thought it sounded really trendy and ridiculous and dangerous, quite honestly. So when I read that book, I thought Dr. Jason Fung was crazy. And I decided to do a fast right then and there for 36 hours, mostly to prove him wrong. Um, I didn't prove him wrong. It went really well for 36 hours. And then I got very angry and did what I think is a really stupid idea for somebody just starting to fast. And that is I didn't eat for 11 days. Um, that's an extended fast, which is something some people do in extreme cases of improving health under the advisement of thefastingmethod.com or a doctor 
but I did it really not knowing, fueled by anger, um, because I did not have the education and this information for these 24 years of obesity and bad health. So I, I every day would cry and be very upset that this was working and I wasn't dying because I didn't eat. And of course I wasn't dying. I had all this extra fat on my body that my body could use as fuel. So I tweeted uh, Dr. Fung, he tweeted me back. I went to Toronto and I met with Jason and Megan and we became friends. And we decided that there should be a book out there that was different. Um, I think there's a lot of great books on fasting, mainly the obesity code and the complete guide to fasting. And there's you know, lots of good stuff. But for me, the thing that was missing was this complete view. Jason being the leading doctor on this topic, Megan being the leading researcher who knows the answers to any question about fasting and me, an everyday person who had failed for 24 years and then found success through fasting and who quite frankly was just not that great at it. So I'm not one of those people that experiences euphoria. I'm not one of those people that fasting is easy for. Obviously, as you can see, I'm not one of those people who just immediately got to 120 pounds. I'm a spelt 185, 190 pounds, which compared to my 300 pound high point is like super crazy hot for me um, in a place I never thought I could achieve. So I've maintained my weight loss now for two years. I rarely get sick. I've been sick twice in the past two years, um, which is really exciting for me. But beyond that, what we really wanted to talk about was we wanted this to be like an everyday language and we wanted you to kind of have that best friend voice, somebody that wouldn't have a filter. Um, that's why you better ask us some good questions today, right? No boring questions. And somebody that would just tell you the truth about what this is really like, how it can be great, how it can be hard, how it really can be used for somebody who just wants to lose five pounds or someone who wants to lose 500 pounds. Um, what, what should we, you expect if you have to go to the bathroom during um, fasting? What is uh, working out like during fasting? What about sex while fasting? How about work while fasting? All these weird things that people are uncomfortable talking about. We're just not uncomfortable talking about it. So um, the biggest thing I think is not just the health behind this. It's your mental feelings. It's being told by a doctor and, and growing in this shame every time you go back to the doctor who's told you to eat these little meals and being feeling fat and feeling like a loser. So I don't know about you. I don't know if you've ever felt that way, um, but I have. And, and, and this book was really supposed to be from all those angles and this emotional and lifestyle side of fasting. So we will get into the questions. Here we go. From Jess Anderson. Hey, Megan and Eve, I am in the last four hours of my 10 day fast. Holy smokes, Jess, you are something else. Thanks, Eve. I watched all your videos daily for inspiration. Jess, thank you. She is talking about fasting.fyi forward slash 10. That's T E N. Um, this is where Megan was crazy enough to say, Sure, Eve, I will coach you through a 10 day fast. If you are completely truthful about everything that you feel, um, so you can see each one of those 10 videos, I think there's 11 because there's one after, one before, um, and that's fasting.fyi forward slash T-E-N. So check those out. All right, Antonia says, um, I have a harder time during my eating window. Just want to eat everything. Any hints from Greece, Megan? Oh, Megan, I think you're on mute. Sorry, there's a, there's a lot of chaos going on now that we're all working from home. I got dogs everywhere. I've got a husband who's incredibly loud, I realize, now that I'm doing this interview. Um, and the kids next door, I think, are about to murder one another. So sorry about that. Um, so eating, well, it really depends on what you are eating. Certain foods will definitely drive up your appetite more than others. So highly processed and refined carbohydrates. Um, so carbohydrates aren't, aren't just things that taste sweet. They're things that can be starchy too. So things like crackers and bread and rice and potatoes, they can definitely, uh, they're, they're definitely sugar uh, and they can also spike your, your appetite. 
just as much as the sweet tasting sugar items like pastries and cookies can as well. So a lot of people think, well, bread doesn't taste sweet, so it can't be sugar, but that's not the truth. It's just a different tasting kind of sugar. So it really depends on what you're eating. So if you are struggling in your eating windows, I would try to reduce those carbohydrates that might be spiking your appetite and lean on more fattier foods. Um, so if you're a plant-based individual, you could eat things like avocados and olives, macadamia nuts, Brazil nuts, walnuts and pecans. Uh, coconut cream um, is a great fat for, for plant-based individuals. Uh, if you're an omnivore or a carnivore, you can lead towards some animal foods. I love chicken wings, like Eve, I love, some, I love a good ribeye, um, bacon and eggs. Um, these fattier foods will definitely help you send a signal to your brain that you are feeling full and over time you'll start to eat less. Dr. Fung and I actually call this um, strategy fat fasting. So you're not exactly fasting fasting, but instead you're eating foods that you like that are higher in fat. And when you're fat fasting, you don't want to eat too many foods. You really only want to pick three or four foods because you want to keep your diet really boring. So when I fat fast, I eat um, bacon, I eat uh, chicken wings, and I eat steak. And I, I eat anytime I feel hungry. But over time, I'd stop feeling hungry. And I also get pretty sick and tired of eating bacon, ribeyes, and chicken wings. And the monotony of a fat fasting approach definitely helps crush the appetite and, and give you back control of your cravings. Thank you, Megan. Robert says, hi, I'm a 46-year-old male who was diagnosed back in 2009 with ulcerate, ulcerative colitis. Although my case is mild and mostly controlled by medication, I was wondering what fasting can do for my condition. I heard what you did for George St. Pierre, the MMA fighter, when you worked with him. Where would be a good starting point for me in terms of fasting? I'm looking to lose about 10 pounds and help control of my colitis condition. Yeah, absolutely. So for fasting for ulcerative colitis, you're looking to do therapeutic levels of fasting meaning that you're doing a 36 or a 42 hour fast three times a week. So what a 36 hour fast looks like is, um, you know, Sunday you could eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then Monday you would fast, Tuesday you would eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Wednesday you would fast, Thursday you would eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Friday you would fast. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday you fast. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday, you eat two or three meals, depending on what your appetite is. Um, on the days that you do fast, it's best to stick to water um, with some salt if you need a bit of a boost throughout the fasting day. So the idea is to try to do longer periods of fasting with just water to ensure that the body's um, evoking this physiological process called autophagy, which is the cellular recycling process. So doing these longer fasts, these 36 or 42 hour fasts, Robert, they'll first help reduce inflammation by ensuring that you're in an adequate state of ketosis. Those ketone bodies um, that your, your fat stores produce help to reduce inflammation. Fasting for durations of 36 or 42 hours also has a significant impact on your insulin levels and reducing your insulin levels can also improve inflammation. So fasting in, in those sense can help uh, with the in inflamed um, portion of the ulcerative uh, colitis, but we can actually see reversals, and we think this is due to the autophagy and the cellular recycling. So until we have more human data on what foods and what beverages inhibit autophagy um, and which ones promote it, uh, Dr. Fung and I stick with water because right now the data isn't all of that compelling. Um, so most individuals who do eat a low carb diet or a very low carb diet called the ketogenic diet will enter a state of ketosis much earlier on than individuals who aren't. But you want to stay in that state of ketosis and stay in that state of autophagy longer to get some of the therapeutic benefits. So that's why the 36 or 42 hour approach is ideal. Um, even GSP, we did the occasional five or seven day fast to help control his inflammation and to try to get into a state of autophagy uh, for a longer period of time to get some cellular healing. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Laura would like to know, what do you do when you're stuck? 
at the same weight, but you're still losing measurements. Is that all fat melting? What is happening? Yeah, so when you fast, I mean, the magic of fasting really, sorry, that the dog. <laughs> the magic. Oh, mine is. <laughs> mine's, mine's wandering. He doesn't like to fast, and it's almost his dinner time. <laughs> uh, so, um, so the magic of fasting happens because when you're in a fasted state, your body produces these counter-regulatory hormones. Counter-regulatory hormones are why your metabolic rate stays up during a fast and what can actually boost your metabolic rate up during a fast. And they're the reason why we start burning body fat. So they're a great thing. And it's those counter-regulatory hormones that do all of the magic. But one of the counter-regulatory hormones we produce is actually human growth hormone. And that can help us rebuild and get stronger. So what happens when you first start losing body fat um, your body will then start to break down the connective tissue that supports that body fat because we no longer need it. So then we end up with this extra protein um, hanging out from that connective tissue that's been broken, broken down. So our body, when we're in a fast state and we're producing the human growth hormone, it will actually utilize some of that protein we break down to, to help build and repair. So we actually get stronger when we're in a fast state as a result of that. And also the human growth hormone production too, when we break our fast, um, we're eating and we're eating protein. So we get more protein. Um, we get a bit of insulin production as well. So we have all of the tools we need to actually grow. So a lot of women actually find that their, their lean mass, their bone mass, and their muscle mass can increase quite significantly once they've been in a fasting group for quite a while. So the important thing here is body composition. The number on the scale just reflects your total weight, which is utterly meaningless. I've been morbidly, I'm five feet tall, I've been morbidly obese at 200 pounds, and I've been morbidly obese at 97 pounds. So just because the scale says an ideal number, doesn't mean that you're in ideal health. I was no more healthy being as overweight with a poor body composition at 97 pounds than 200 pounds. And I see this all of the time with skinny type two diabetics. The goal is not to lose weight and weigh 60 pounds. The goal is to alter your body composition. And the scale just quite frankly doesn't tell you what that is. So if you have a lot of body fat, but very little muscle and bone mass, then you're extremely unhealthy and you're at high risk for diabetes and cardiovascular disease, regardless of what that total number is. So it's really important to make sure you have a healthy ratio of lean mass, which is bone mass and muscle mass, compared to your fat mass. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Sanja is homeschooling mom of five kiddos. Oh my gosh, Sanja. I got one and I'm barely hanging on. So we, you know, I'm very impressed with you. Kids need meals throughout the day and we cook from scratch. How do I help strengthen my mental fasting muscle while cooking for my kiddos? It is hard to fast when preparing and serving my kiddos food. I have been working on being more aware of my emotions and how they influence my desire to eat when I don't need to. I'll take this one, Megan, if it's okay with you. Yeah. Um, Cause I don't think, you know, Megan is, is feeding dogs. So I don't think she's trying <laughs> to eat that food. I don't know. I have one kid. I have a husband. First of all, ask for help. So if you have a partner who can help, who can cook when you're fasting, ask for that first. Second, if you have kids that are older that can help with some of the cooking and they're up for that, ask for that help as well. Start asking more people for help. Third, cook larger meals when you're not fasting and put, cook three times as much and put those other two away. So when you're fasting, as you're making that muscle stronger, you don't have to worry about it. I used to not be able to cook when I was fasting. I don't even know. I, actually, I don't know if I can cook while I'm fasting now because I just don't, because I have a great partner who does and I don't have to worry about it. I know that's not the, the same situation. Some partners are working. Some people are busy. I get that. But ask for more help and cook bigger meals when you're not fasting and give yourself time to get stronger with this fasting muscle before you cook while fasting if you can. That would be my suggestion. Um, hello, says Himena. Some doctors have told me that women should only fast for 14 hours, not more. But I have heard that in order to use fat as fuel, one should fast 17 hours and that the real benefits autophagy are achieved at passing the 20 hours. Should women follow a fasting longer than 14 hours? It's Megan. You're on mute again. Sorry, the dog. Sorry. Right. Uh, <laughs> they're 
food's actually pretty good. <laughs> so. The dog food is actually pretty good. Oh gosh, Megan. Yeah, they're having lamb and salmon. Oh, okay. For dinner. <laughs> you love lamb. Um, I, I don't really know where any of these claims about women not fasting for more than 14 hours. I even had a like a healthcare practitioner of mine tell me that recently. He's like, you're not doing that, are you? And I said, well, what, like, why? And he said, well, the data says that you shouldn't. And I'm like, what data? Like, really? Because like, as far as I'm concerned, I'm the only one with this amount of data on fasting and women. So I'd really like to know. He couldn't point me to anything. Well, he had just heard that that's what the data showed. So this is one of these really bad urban myths or urban legends. Um, at least 60%, if not more, uh, of the patients Dr. Fung and I have seen in clinic and a, a large part of our online program, the people that I've worked with through fasting coaching and within our community are women. We do have a lot of men in the program. They do great, but we have a tremendous number of women as well. Um, and they fast for 36, 42 hours. Uh, Jess, uh, Jess is just about to wrap up a 10-day fast and like her before and after photos from day one to day 10 that she just posted in our forum are mind blowing. Um, and there's only improved health benefits. We actually had one young woman that I was working with. She was 23 years old and she, because her PCS was so bad, hadn't had a period for two and a half years. So her mother convinced her to give fasting a shot. Um, we started doing 42 hours of fasting three times a week. On the other four days of the week, we did 16 to 18 hour fast, no snacks, and we agreed to, uh, to compromise on her diet a little bit. Monday through Friday when she ate, she would eat what her mother cooked, um, but Saturday and Sunday, she wouldn't have to report what she ate <laughs> into us. Um, but within six months of doing that, she started having regular menstrual cycles, and ever since then, for over a year and a half now, she's had regular periods. So I don't know where all these urban legends come from and tons of women, perimenopausal, postmenopausal, going through menopause, uh, whatever stage of life a woman is in, we've only seen great results and improved health um, through fasting. So I'm not, not quite sure where all of that jazz comes from. I'm actually working on a, a, a book called Women in Fasting, where we sort of dive into what my clinical experience has been with women and what the results are. Thank you for that, Megan. Aria says, what should be the ideal fat percentage for a woman at 37 years? So ideally for a woman, trying to aim somewhere between 20 and 25% body fat is a really great target to make sure you've absolutely minimized your risk of cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. Got it. Ari says, I'm five foot, oh, also, I'm five foot one, 115 pounds. However, waist circumference at 38 inches, what would your recommendation be? So with, I mean, you always have to check with your doctor. But we usually encourage um, people get into the rhythm of doing a 36 to 42 hour fast three times a week. And on uh, weeks they can't do that, of course, doing 24 hour fast three times a week instead. But for the majority of time, striving for that three to uh, 36 to 42 hours of fasting three times a week. If that starts to not get the results, um, then deviating to 248 hour fasts or 172 hour fasts, or even trying to do one of these extended fasts, um, like five, seven, or 10 days, for example. Um, but usually the base fast of 336 or 342 hours um, gets great results, and changing it up periodically can be beneficial if you're feeling stuck. Now, for women and for men with metabolic syndrome, there are a ton of men out there that are not getting diagnosed with hypothyroidism, that are struggling with all different types of hormonal issues um, that men years ago never faced when it came to weight loss. So it is, it is a struggle uh, for, for men as it is for women. Um, so usually the first couple of weeks of doing 336 or 342s, you might not see any change. Every now and then someone miraculously drops like seven pounds in the first two weeks. Um, but I'll tell you that that is not the norm. So if that's what you read on social media or heard from your friend, that's not the norm. Usually it takes about six, uh, six 36 or 42 hour fasts to start to get the weight loss ball rolling. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, this person says, I've been doing low carb, high fat with intermittent fasting for nine months. I'm down only one size clothing and not seeing the results that I see others have. I did break my leg and not able to exercise, but really trying to stick to plan. Any thoughts would be welcome. I'm mid fifties and have tried many different plans with success and then to only put it all back on and then some things. So, um, there's a lot of different definitions for intermittent fasting. Um, based on our experience, uh, a 16, an 18, and a 20 hour, four hour fast are nice. They're nice for eating days. They are not considered fasting days. They don't reach any of those therapeutic zones that you're trying to get. And even if you follow a really strict, rigid ketogenic diet, you're still not getting into that much of your own body fat fueling mode. First, your body is going to fuel off the fat that you eat. And then after that, if you get into a fat burning mode, then you'll start fueling off of the fat on your body. But you need to allow enough time for that to happen. So, if, uh, so we don't really consider 16 or 18 hours of fasting to be intermittent fasting. A 24 hour plan is good if you just can't keep up with your 36 or 42 that week. Um, but I would, I would revisit, you know, and see what your definition of intermittent fasting is. Most women have to do 36 or 42 hours, and same with men with metabolic syndrome. That needs to be the base fast. So we were talking in the community today, uh, one of our members um, lost a relative last week, and it was a stressful week. So this week, we're doing 324s because we're being kind to ourselves, we're, we're still taking care of ourselves, but we're being kind to ourselves and trying to reduce the stress. But next week, it's to get back into 342s. And um, so that needs to sort of be the, the mindset if you're really looking for fasting for weight loss. Another thing, the biggest mistake I see is that people snack. They think, oh, I'm eating today and I can eat from 12 until 8 p.m. And that's not the case. Snacking, even if you're snacking on low carb or ketogenic foods, can cause insulin resistance and can worsen insulin resistance. So one of the biggest issues I see is people snacking. So it's just about going back to the basics and eating those meals. You know, look back at our grandparents and our great grandparents' generations. They certainly didn't eat the perfect foods. See, my grandmother grew up, Coca-Cola was a thing. Potato chips were a thing. Um, but they weren't allowed to snack before dinner or after dinner. They had to save their appetite for their meal or they didn't eat enough. So it was their fault. They'll know to eat more next time. They didn't go to school with bags of treats and nor were they fed treats all day long while they were at school as well. Um, and obesity wasn't a concern back then. Type two diabetes was not as prevalent as it is now. So it's really about the meal timing and people need to remember that on their eating days, especially right now with COVID and we're all stuck at home. And I hear you on Monday, I got myself into some trouble snacking on some dark chocolate and I felt terrible for it afterwards. So um, snacking is a huge issue because food is just so readily available and convenient these days. Christine says, how long do you suggest fat fasting for a newbie to fasting? Yeah, most people um, find that it takes somewhere between about three to seven days to really get their appetite under control. Uh, I find that usually after someone fat fasts for about three days, they're already starting to fast naturally, meaning that they're not snacking in between meals and they might actually find that they're taking less meals overall. Usually by the end of the week, people are into a 24 hour fast or they're feeling like they can even go longer. And that's even for a newbie. So fat fasting is a great strategy to sort of kickstart and get into a longer state of fasting in a shorter period of time. Linda asked, does a pre-workout drink of, with 2,275 milligrams of sugar break the fast? So that is a lot of sugar. Um, so I'm not quite sure if Linda means sugar or sodium exactly, because I know that there are a lot of people out there that will add salt or buy these electrolyte beverages to help them. Um, but yes, that much sugar would absolutely um, counteract the, the benefits or the purpose of the fasting. If you're fasting, especially for weight loss or type two diabetes, metabolic syndrome, um, the purpose of the fast is to really like 
go for an extended period of time without producing any excess insulin and allow your own insulin levels to fall. And whenever we eat anything, our insulin levels do go up. They go up a lot more when we have sugar than when we have fat, but we still produce insulin. And if we're already extremely insulin resistant or have hyperinsulinemia, um, adding any little bit of insulin to our system is counterproductive. So that much sugar would definitely drive your insulin levels sky high and be very counterproductive for our fast. Now, if you're talking about sodium, <laughs> that's another story. Um, it's quite a lot of sodium to take at once. Um, I would probably dilute it down to, or just have a quarter of that beverage diluted down in water before a workout. Got it. Leanne says, is strict keto necessary on feasting days or could 50 grams net carbs be okay? Also on feasting days, how do you determine protein needs and calorie needs to maintain or lose weight and body composition? Yeah, so it really depends on what your health situation is. Earlier this morning, I met with a group of latent onset type one diabetics or type one and a half diabetics. And these individuals, unfortunately, um, are going to have to follow a pretty rigid ketogenic diet for life. Well, not unfortunately. I mean, I choose, uh, I choose to follow a diet that enables me to stay in ketosis the majority of the time. Um, but they're going to have to be a little bit extra strict. But I find most people with type two, regular type 2 diabetes or looking to lose weight have flexibility. I'll tell you just a little bit about myself since I, I actually have the most ketone data on myself. Um, is that when I was very insulin resistant, I could bear like maybe 30 total grams of carbs. That was it to keep me in ketosis. Often I had to stay under 20 total grams of carbs. It was stressful because I was so metabolically broken. Nowadays, I eat upwards to between 70 and 100 grams of carbohydrates on an eating day. My fasting windows are a lot shorter um, these days because I'm at a healthy body composition, but my ketones are just as high, if not higher, than they were when I was doing a really restricted ketogenic diet. So as you do heal and as you do recover, um, your, your body is uh, more efficient at fat burning. It's a lot more insulin sensitive and you can eat more carbohydrates. Now, the carbohydrates I eat are mostly non-starchy vegetables with a little bit of starchy vegetables. I don't eat any grains and I eat berries and avocados. So it does make a big difference. I'm not eating 100 grams of carbohydrates from pizza or pasta or processed or refined carbohydrates. When I usually work with people, I encourage them to not really count or care so much about the number of carbs they're getting from non-starchy vegetables and avocados, but just to be a little bit more mindful of the number of carbs that they're consuming from starches like root vegetables and from fruit overall. Sandra says, I'm still working my way through your book and love it. I appreciate the perspective and it really makes sense with my mental experience. Right, Sandra? I mean, there's just no way to separate the mind from the body. So we, we really appreciate that. From Diana, and I'll take this one. Hello, what would you recommend for a bariatric patient who wants to do fasting? So Diana, I have had three bariatric surgeries. I had lap band and I had lap band replacement and then I had gastric sleeve. Um, sometimes because we're bari bariatric patients and our stomachs are smaller, we can't get as much satiety as someone else can get. We can't eat to where we're completely full at times. It, sometimes it's different for everybody. Um, what I find is sometimes instead of just eating, but let's say I wanted to just eat between 12 and uh, 7, I do find that sometimes I have to eat at 12, 3, and 7. That's the only adjustment I really find that I make as a bariatric patient. Um, other than that, I, I really don't have any changes. The thing that I found, I think, that will maybe affect you the most is the anger, right? So like, let's say you've spent all this risk and this money and this time having bariatric surgeries that you thought would make you feel less hungry. If you're like me and you did that for decades and then you used fasting and realized that just eating less often made you less hungry um, my biggest shift was going to therapy to deal with that anger so that that would be my advice on that uh, Leanne says I love to plant a garden and I'm scared I won't be able to eat vegetables and low GI fruits that I 
grow? Can you incorporate tomato, cantaloupe, berries into feasting days? I eat berries. Um, I think cantaloupe is disgusting, so I'm not going to even touch <laughs> that answer because it's just gross. I also eat tomatoes. I think a lot of times when people do fasting and feasting, sometimes we're terrified of certain foods. Look, you're, you're not talking about giant chunks of brownies and, and ice cream. You're talking about some fruits and vegetables and berries are really great. Um, and, and unless Megan disagrees, I, I think you're fine doing these things. No, I love leafy greens. Um, when I first started fasting, uh, my thyroid was too shot to help to enjoy vegetables without getting bloated and being miserable. So I definitely lean more on my animal foods. Um, but as my thyroid got better and I, I got into a healthy space, I love eating all kinds of vegetables. I love, I've had berries today. I had my eating window from uh, 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern today. And I enjoyed some raspberries. Um, I don't love avocados, but I eat them. <laughs> so, so enjoy the food from your garden. When it comes to non-berries and non avocados avocados and olives as fruits just be more mindful of your serving of them and just make sure you have them at your meals that you're not snacking on them between meals so if you're going to have something that's a little bit more sugary like cantaloupe try to not have too much of it and try to make sure you're eating it in your meal times not outside of your meal time got it Pam says, I've been practicing intermittent fasting daily since finding Dr. Fung's videos two and a half years ago. I was pre-diabetic and I lost 40 pounds. However, the last six months have been very hard. I've been very hungry and I've gained a bit of weight. I'm going to take this first and then pass it to Megan. Um, I don't know about you, Pam, but I think the past two months have been hard for almost everyone. I think that there is an increase in stress because the world is in a pandemic. Um, I think there's an increase in stress because a lot of people are dealing with economic issues. And I've gained a little bit of weight too because I've eaten a few things. I'm not supposed to say that. I wrote a book on fasting. I'm a New York Times bestseller. I'm supposed to be perfect the rest of my life. Pam, that's just not how it works. You lost 40 pounds. You've been doing this for two and a half years. Life is a series of fluctuations. And what I hear you say is you gained a little bit of weight. That means you are operating like a normal person whose weight fluctuates. Megan, you want to add something to that? Yeah, the stress definitely makes us start to snack and graze. And I found that was the biggest thing in our community that was causing the, the weight creep. Um, so even despite good fasting, if you're still grazing on your eating days, the scale can go up. So just be mindful of you know, sticking to your eating windows, only eating at meals, even if the foods aren't perfect. Um, stress itself is going to drive, uh, drive up your body's potential to gain weight. So, you know, taking time for some self-care, some ups and salt baths, going on some walks, checking in with some friends that make you laugh or smile, journaling, meditating, just trying to get your stress under control can be helpful. And then to revisit what it is that you're doing with fasting, um, just to recap, the 16, the 18, and the 24 hours of fasting really don't result in weight loss. Dr. Fung and I consider 16 and 18 hours to be just a normal, healthy eating day. Um, 24 hours can be used as a substitute for when you can't do 36 or 42s to achieve weight loss. So most women and most men with metabolic syndrome um, need to do the 36 or 42s. And I can tell you that even for women and, and men also who have a lot of metabolic syndrome, if you're not snacking, uh, or sorry, if you are snacking on your eating days, you're going to make it a lot more painful than it needs to be. It's really important to cut out the snacks. Got it. Megan, Laura says, I have been fasting for the past two weeks for 16 to 38 hour periods. I have 28 pounds to lose. I am feeling like I need to consistent approach such as OMAD or one meal a day. I eat a low carb, high fat diet regularly for the last four years. It has taken four years to lose 43 pounds. Nice job, Laura. Will I still lose weight on OMAD? Probably not. I actually did our whole, we, did, we run these weekly group fasting challenges in, in our fasting method community. And I did a whole t t video on like stop the OMAD madness um, <laughs> for yesterday's group fast video. The bottom line is you're, you're either going to stall out on your weight loss or you're going to 
or you could even develop weight gain. Um, because what's important about the fasting is the variation. And if you do the same thing every day, you're not allowing for any variation. The body will adapt and it will stop producing those magical hormones that make fasting so beneficial, those counter-regulatory hormones. So if in, in our community, if people want to do one meal a day, we have them alternate what meals those are. So like for example, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, you would have lunch, and Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, you would have dinner, rather than fasting from lunch to lunch or dinner to dinner on a consistent basis. So if you wanted to do OMAD, the best approach would be to mix it up and just vary the meals. Um, so that's something uh, we're actually doing in our household next week is Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we're having lunch, and Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, we're having dinner. Saturday will be a bit of an earlier dinner. Um, and Sunday we'll probably have lunch and dinner, brunch and an early dinner. And this actually causes variation in the fast. So if you do the math, <laughs> fasting from Monday lunch to Tuesday dinner is about 30 hours. And fasting from Tuesday dinner to Wednesday lunch is about 16 to 18 hours. So every day, every other day you're doing a 30 hour fast and every other day you're doing a 16 to 18 hour fast. So that variation is important in the fasting window. You don't want to have a 20 to 24 hour fasting window every single day. That's the surest way to plateau and to bottom out. Got it. John V says, uh, my name is John V from India. I have started fasting past six days. I'm feeling really good but since I am a pure vegetarian. I really get confused what to eat. John V, I have a really nice um, episode with JD Buta on uh, fastinglane.com on our podcast. You should look that up because he is a vegetarian and helps people do vegetarian low carb. Um, and I think you'll get a lot of, of good information on that. But yes, you can absolutely do it. I mean, we support people eating the way that is right for their body and everybody has different needs, but these can all be combined with some form of fasting. Um, Elle says, I'm a 38 year old woman from Belgium. I had just been diagnosed with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. My weight is at 170 pounds. How fast can I expect to get rid of my liver issues when I start fasting? Which fasting regimen would you advise to me, Megan? So I would do at least 24 hours, three times a week for fatty liver. Um, you probably would experience more weight loss with the 36 or 42 hour fast three times a week. Um, fatty liver, if, if you are aiming for the majority of your fasting uh, days to be 36 and 42 with the occasional 24, the occasional week of 24s due to a holiday or a stressful event or uh, just feeling off. Um, you should see significant improvement in six months. I think that at our data at the clinic, it's about six months that we see um, significant improvements. I reverse my fatty liver completely within six months. Got it. Uh, Chris says, I am devouring, pun intended, all the info I can on your site. I do a 16-hour fast by default pretty often. We have a strong history of NAFLD in my family, and I'm determined to not spend my life sick and die young like my relatives. Any tips specific to this condition? Thank you for all you do. Thank you. So um, that's for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what that was. The acronym, I know there's actually, there's like several acronyms for fatty liver disease. Yeah. So like some combination of letters in the alphabet probably mean fatty liver <laughs> disease. Um, so the best, the best thing I think if, if you are doing fasting for prevention, um, following a 16 or 18 hour fast daily, not snacking, just eating those meals, and occasionally doing a 24-hour fast is a great way to maintain your good health. Um, fatty liver, uh, a big culprit of fatty liver disease is fructose and high fructose corn syrup. So um, sugars, candies, pastries, sodas, um, juices, uh, they're all large contributors of fatty liver disease and excess, uh, just excess sugar and excess fruit consumption in general are big contributors of fatty liver disease. Um, when I would work with someone and I would see that they have fatty liver disease based on their ultrasound results or lab tests, and I would tell them, they would say, but you know, I don't drink beer and I don't drink wine and I, or I'm not that often. And, um, and I said, no, but do you drink sodas? Do you drink juices? 
and uh, a lot of the times, oh, you know, I drink a, a liter of apple juice a day or I drink a liter of orange juice a day. Isn't that good for me? That's a heck of a lot of fructose, uh, a heck of a lot of fruit sugar. And in a lot of cases in North America and other uh, first world countries, we add a lot of sugar to our already sugary fruit juices too. So, um, so it's not, not the beer and not the wine uh, or the margaritas uh, that are often the culprit. It's usually the juices and the sodas. Hmm. I didn't know that. I am learning so much. Um, John B says, I am suffering from obesity, anxiety, and depression, and I am really keen on getting healthy. Do you think fasting will help me get rid of all these issues? I'll, I'll start with that, um, and then Megan can take over. I think that fasting may help you deal with some of the physical feelings that might be contributing to this, and you should definitely do it to find out. However, I think that sometimes, maybe at least for me, eating was a good way to not deal with my feelings, to not deal with unhappiness or an unhappy marriage or frustration in my job. I'm in a happy marriage now, don't worry. <laughs> but um, I think that sometimes when you fast, at least my experience was I couldn't get away from things I was unhappy about then. And so at first you might go through like I did an experience of getting sadder and having to deal with those emotions and having to cry or be angry or right and actually deal with the things in your life when you no longer have food to distract you all the time. So I want you to be cognizant of that possibility for you. Um, but there are a lot of people who use fasting and find that they were very depressed when they ate a lot of Harvey foods. They were very depressed when they ate all the time. And I think the truth is you just will not know until you try, right? And Megan, is that, is that pretty close? Yeah. And I think diet really makes a big impact too. I do think fasting helps. Um, but what you eat can really make a big difference. Even when you're um, in a bad spot and you do rely on food to, to help you, there's a big difference between, you know, eating a pound of bacon or eating a bag of macadamia nuts um, versus, you know, eating a pizza or a cake uh, and how you feel a couple of hours later. Um, so stress eating, of course, you know, you want to have healthier relationships with how you manage stress and healthier relationships with food. That's important. But I think what you eat has a really sort of profound effect on your mood and your anxiety. So uh, eating a real whole food based diet that is lower in sugar, um, I think is really important for helping with depression and anxiety. Thank you. Um, when you're fasting, is it okay to take vitamins and supplements? And what about the ones that say to take with food? Yeah, so often um, vitamins and supplements aren't that helpful on an empty stomach. Uh, a lot of people in our program do take magnesium because it often helps counteract some of the side effects of fasting and uh, can help give them a bit of a boost on their eating day or on their fasting days, an energy boost. Um, and there's, there's no need to take that with food. Um, as long as you're taking a, you know, a good quality magnesium supplement. Um, I think it depends on the pros and the cons. If you don't really need to take supplements on your fasting days, then just don't do it. Um, but if it is really critical that you do um, take something on your fasting day, some sort of supplement that your doctor wants you to take, then you could take a little bit of fat or a little bit of fiber with it just to help it be absorbed. Most vitamins are fat soluble. So taking a, tea, uh, a teaspoon or a tablespoon of olive oil or MCT oil along with your vitamins can help them be absorbed without really interfering with the fast too much. Got it. Peggy says, thanks for doing another chat. I still have a question. Uh, what can we do when breaking a fast 18 to 20 hours to avoid urgent bathroom issues? Peggy, that is a, a question that only you can figure out. I can eat anything after 11 days. It's my superpower. I can like not eat for 11 days, eat a bunch of bacon and be fine. Some people can fast for just a little while and eat something and really have a tough time. Megan, any tips there? Yeah, so, so it, it's really individual, as Eve said. I have found the most common culprits are nuts and eggs for upsetting the stomach. Now, um, if you typically break your fast with nuts or with eggs and feel fine, then don't stop eating nuts and eggs and you break your fast. This doesn't apply to you. 
Um, but if you are struggling, um, trying to stay away from nuts and or eggs for your first meal is important. Um, try not to eat raw vegetables as well, because sometimes that can send you running to the bathroom. So I would avoid salads and eat more cooked vegetables. Sometimes meats that are tougher to digest, like red meat, uh, can be more difficult as compared to poultry or fish uh, as well. Um, occasionally, people need to take a glass of water with a tablespoon of chia seeds or psyllium husk and drink that to help them bulk up their stools so they don't have to run to the bathroom. Because sometimes, regardless of what we eat, we, we still might have some issues going to the bathroom. So the fiber can help bulk things up from the psyllium or the chia. All right, Megan, I know you have a call in four minutes, so we're gonna go really quick. Okay. What fasting protocol is suited for my husband who has gout, uric acid at eight? So with, um, with a gout attack, you actually want to minimize fast till the gout attack is over. So you would wanna to stick to more 16 or 18 hours of fasting. And then when the gout attack is over, start slowly building up from 24 to 30 to 36 hours of fasting over the course of a couple of months. You don't wanna do it too quickly. Leanne says, I'm on hour 84 of fasting, feeling fine. So I guess I'll leave it open as to whether I can go five or seven days. Is there any signals from your body that you should end a fast? I feel guilty toward wanting to stop fasting. Leanne. As soon as I start fasting, I always want to stop fasting. I don't care if it's three hours after I started our three days. I'm like, should I stop? So don't feel guilty. Some people are just like that. Megan, is nausea a signal that you should stop fasting? Yeah, if you feel nauseous, cut your fast and have a meal. Got it. Um, I have your book on Kindle and have really benefited from reading it. I'm still looking for a protein requirement or maybe what percentage of macros protein may affect insulin. We purposely did not put those things in the book because our theory, and this is not for everyone, but for me, it has been, I eat what I want. I eat during specific times. I fast in between those feasts. I eat what makes me feel good and I measure nothing because I don't want to live a life like that. Megan, any last thoughts on that? Um, Dr. Fung, if you read any of his stuff, um, he's a big proponent for moderate protein for longevity. But when you're new to fasting, and especially if you have any sort of underlying thyroid issues, even ones that might not be able to be diagnosed accurately through blood tests, your body does need more protein. So as Eve said, we encourage people to eat, eat until they feel satiated, eat real whole foods, uh, and then to adjust their protein based on their test results. And then as, they, as you heal, you'll have to modify your macronutrients as you go. So that's something we work on um, with people in our fast program. Got it. Megan, I have been fasting Saturday evening through Tuesday morning, eating one or two meals on Tuesday and fasting on Tuesday night again through Saturday morning. I eat once or twice on Saturday. I've been doing this for a month of April. I feel pretty good. My brother's been doing this for three years and has lost over 100 pounds. My question is, am I okay to carry on like this as long as it seems to be working? Alternatively, if I feel like it gets to be too much, how can I go about figuring out how long to fast to achieve results? I want to lose weight, lessen my, lessen my perimenopausal symptoms, and beat my genetic predisposition for type 2 diabetes. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're doing a fasting regimen and it's working for you and you're following up with your doctor and having blood test results done and everything's okay, um, there's no need to change it up. Uh, if it stops working for you, um, you know, the, I would sort of switch, switch it up to doing more of an intermittent style fast since there seems to be two sort of two extended fasts every week. So I would go to, um, uh, three 36 or 24 hours of fasting and see actually sometimes fasting a little bit less can help break through a plateau too depending on what fasting strategy you're coming off of so that's a quite an aggressive one um, but I still make sure you're following up with your doctor make sure you're getting your your lab results tested to make sure you're not running into any issues and I've worked with lots of people who have done like five day fasts every week for a year a year and a half and have lost over 150 pounds and that works for them and they just get their blood tests drawn regularly and they have their doctor's support um, but if it stops working then it's to change it up and sometimes changing it up means fasting less not necessarily more 
All right, Megan, run to your next call. <laughs> questions that I will grab. You can check Megan out at thefastingmethod.com. Megan, thank you so much. Thanks, thank everybody. You, Megan. Thanks. Happy fasting. So, Himena, is it okay to do HIT exercise if you are fasting? Yes, it is okay to do any type of exercise if you are fasting, as long, of course, as you check with your doctor on that specific exercise that you're doing. Fasting, uh, for me specifically, when I work out, I much prefer to do it fasted. I feel better when I work out fasted, um, and I know that I'm getting right to burning the fat on my body. Um, someone has asked, I'm an otherwise good health, but need to lose 100 pounds. When you say 24 or 36 a few times a week, how does that work? Those are just fancy terms for eat a meal, wait 24 hours, eat another meal. That's what a 24 is. So for example, you eat dinner, you don't eat until the next day at the same time. 36 would be you eat dinner, you don't eat the three meals the next day, and the following day when you wake up, you would eat breakfast. So it's just the number of hours. And so that's what she's suggesting to do that a couple of times a week. That's for the best rate for weight loss. Ryan says, I had nausea twice while doing five day fast. I broke my fast, but I was thinking it was a lack of enough salt. What would be reasons for nausea? Fasting five days seems to be my stopping point. Usually a lack of salt is not gonna cause nausea. A lack of salt will typically cause headaches, feeling a little bit of dizziness, but not so much nausea. Nausea is a reason to stop your fast. Some people just have a stopping point of five days. Some people have a stopping point of two weeks. Some people have a stopping point of one day. You got to pay attention to your body, work with a doctor and listen to it. Sandy says, thank you for the webinar. Is it being recorded? Can we access this after it's over? And I'm going to turn that back over to your host so she can answer that question and let you know if there'll be a recording and where you can find it. Uh, guys, my name is Eve Mayer and you can check me out at fastinglane.com and um, to your health and hotness.